All right, so let's let's talk steak machines. Oh, by the way, um, tomorrow, Friday, um, engineering club meeting at 12 as usual. I think 12.30 um, after the club meeting in the usual room, 126, I'm gonna do about a 40, 45 minute talk on field programmable gate arrays, the history of them and sort of the general story of them and I'll do a quick demo on FPGAs. So FPGAs are the last topic we cover in this course and it's the topic <coughs> of your optional lab age. So I won't really say anything in there that we're not gonna go over in here except maybe the history of it, but if you're interested and you got time and you wanna go to club meeting anyway, um, 12.30 I'll be doing that talk um, in room 126. So for what it's worth, it might be interesting. Um, and I believe they have pizza, so that's the advantage over class. I should give pizza in class here every day. That would like, that would help attendance in some of my other classes. <coughs> All right, so this was, this was our, our uh, quick guide from Tuesday on analyzing state machines. So we'll, we'll come back to this, but um, we're already starting, we're already at state uh, step five here. We have a state transition diagram, right? That's where we're beginning in the synthesis question. So our real goal is to make a state transition table. Okay, once we have that, we'll be able to read off um, the values of the flip-flop inputs. And it's just a truth table. We know how to turn truth tables into equations, right? Product of sums, sum of products, K maps, all that stuff will come into play here. So once we have a state transition table, we can write equations. And once we have equations, we can draw a circuit diagram, okay? So our real goal this afternoon is going to be going from this to a transition table. Well, as fun as it is to write happy, very sad on our, our pages, we want to have sort of uh, a way to do states in binary, right? Our states are going to be combinations of flip-flop outputs, right? So before we can actually come up with a design for our state machine, we've got to answer two questions, which the first one is, is pretty much completely arbitrary. And that is what kinds of flip-flops are we going to use? And there's nothing in this diagram that says you must use T flip-flops. Or the only way to build this is with D flip-flops. Okay, we can use any kinds of flip-flops that we want. We could mix them together. We could say we're going to use a D flip-flop and a T flip-flop and two JK flip-flops. And we could build a machine using those. Okay, so the answer to this question is either A, you've been told, implement this circuit using D flip-flops. Okay, now you know what kind of flip-flops you're going to use. Or, gee, the only thing I have in my parts box, box anymore is a bunch of T flip-flops. I guess that's what I'm going to use. Okay, or something like that. There's some external criteria. Or you try it with every possible kind of flip-flop and see which design works better for you, which one is lower power or takes fewer wires or something. But somewhere this question has to get answered. And in this course, we're pretty much going to tell you what kind of flip-flops to use. Okay, or we'll vote on it and do the democratic approach. Okay, um, so I'm going to save you from possibly a vote that goes against your best interest. And I'm going to say for this example, let's use D flip-flops because D flip-flops are going to be the most straightforward to work with. But then we're gonna redo the same example with T flip-flops and then we'll probably redo it with JK flip-flops just to get like the full experience, okay? So um, we're gonna use D flip-flops and it's effectively an arbitrary decision. Okay, now the second question is slightly less arbitrary how many flip-flops. So how many flip-flops do we need to implement this machine? We only need two, right? Why? Because with two flip-flops, we have four possible combinations of flip-flop states. Zero, 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 one, one, zero, one, one. And we only need to represent four states. 
Could we implement this with more than two flip-flops? Sure. Is there ever a reason to? Actually, yes. There's a reason why we might actually want to use four flip-flops to implement this. Now that's twice as many flip-flops, that's more expensive. But we'll talk about what it would mean to implement this with four flip-flops after we get through some of the legwork here. But I want to make sure we get into the guts of this. But for now, um, to answer this question, we'll just pick some number n where 2 to the n um, is large enough. to cover all states. So we've got four states. All we need is two flip-flops. Two to the four, two to the two is four. So for us, we're gonna pick two flip-flops. So two D flip-flops. All right, so next thing and this is a little out of order from what we did before. Um, make a state assignment table. And I say it's out of order because we did this at the beginning of the analysis, so it seems like we should do it at the end of the synthesis. But we're making this table so that we can just translate everything we're doing from things like very happy or state D or things like that into combinations of flip-flop values. So we want to do it at the beginning of our process, whether we're analyzing or synthesizing. So let's make a state table over here. <coughs> so very happy, happy sad and very sad. And we have two D flip-flops. And when I do synthesis, I'm always going to start numbering my flip-flops from zero. I'm going to call the outputs Q. I'm going to call the inputs whatever the inputs are called. And I'm going to list my zeros on the right. right? I'm going to be very consistent in this. And you don't have to do it my way, but you got to be consistent when you do this yourself. If you kind of haphazardly, sometimes you say D1, D0, sometimes you say D0, D1, it's gonna be easier to make mistakes. Okay, if you force yourself into a particular pattern, right, for writing these things and working with these things, it'll help keep you from, from tripping up. So I'm going to call my outputs Q1 and Q0. Those are gonna be outputs of my two flip-flops. And we can assign combinations of these in whatever way we want to our states. So I don't want to think too hard on a Thursday. So I'll just do the sort of usual ordering. So there's my state assignment table. And guess what? We've already started to sketch our circuit. Because now I know I've got 2D flip-flops. I'm going to call this D0, D1, Q0, Q1. I'm going to go ahead and list Q0 bar and Q1 bar because I might need them. And using these will save me from taking Q1 and putting it through an inverter. And I'm always going to clock my flip-flops together. So I'm going to tie them together with a wire and I'm just going to call this clock. And I know there's going to be an input. There's this W variable which tells me whether it's sunny or cloudy. So I'm just going to have a wire out here called W that's going to feed into something. So I got to start on my circuit design already. So we've got our state assignment table. So a state transition table, 
at the end, we basically list the next state based on the current state and the input. Right? We start off by making one row for input state combination, and then we list the current state in terms of Q values and outputs. And then we list the inputs to the flip-flops, and we go from there. Okay, so I'm going to put my table on a different sheet. Let's save our circuit diagram. So we have one input variable W, and we have four possible states Q1, Q0. Okay, I'm going to put these in a the table. So input W. Present state. Well, your present state is very happy, and your input could be zero, or your present state could be very happy, and your input one, or it could be happy with an input of zero or one, or it could be sad with an input of zero, one, or it could be very sad with an input of zero or one. I'm going to use the state assignment that I made to list my present state in terms of Q1 and Q0 now. And I'm just looking these up. Very happy is going to be zero, zero. Sad is going to be one, zero, and so on. So this is still present state. And this is usually just PS in the book. And I'm just going to fill in my value. So very happy is 0, 0. Happy is 0, 1. Sad is 1, 0. Very sad is 1, 1. So list all input and present state combos. That's what we've just done, right, in uh, table. Write present state in terms of Q outputs. So that's what we've done here. And now, write next state plus if there's any separate outputs from the machine, plus outputs based on the diagram. Transition diagram. <coughs> okay, so looking at the state transition diagram, the thing that we were starting with, we're going to fill in some more information here. In particular, Next stage. And if we had outputs either in each state or on each transition, we would list those also. So we're translating this into our table now. So if you're very happy and you have a zero, your next state is happy. If you're very happy and your input's one, your next state is very happy. And you're really just reading off from here. So if your input's zero and you're happy, what's your next stage? Sad. And if you're happy and your input is a one, very happy. Very happy. All right. If you're sad and your input is a zero, then you go to very sad. If you're very sad and your if you're sad and your input is a one, go up to half. Very sad and your input zero. Very sad and very sad and input one. Sad. I'm done with this. Uh, this kind of system is kind of interesting because happy and sad 
the ones that are in the center cannot repeat themselves. They, they will always change. Yes, them. yeah, which is kind of an interesting statement on human psyche. Well, <laughs> if this was valid. <laughs> well, no, but like uh, in terms of like the machine, uh, like if you're very sad, you can continue to be very sad forever. Yeah, until yeah. Until you get a one, which you will but it's same with very happy, which is up. But if you're in these, you'll always end up switching. Yeah, they're always transient. Okay. So, so it's very different from a counter, right? A counter, you might have like a go, don't go input, and you could stay in any state. In this one, you're right. Those two states, you're only going to be in them temporarily. But you could bounce back and forth between them. Correct, yeah. Right. But this one, you can stay in forever. Same with that. It's a cool observation. All right, so we don't need the diagram anymore, okay? Um, but we're going to write the next state in terms of flip-flop values. So we're going to use this lookup table again. So happy is 0, 1. Very happy is 0, 0. Sad is 1, 0. And very sad is 1, 1. <coughs> Done with that. So, right, next state in terms of flip flop outputs. This was flip flop outputs. So, write the next state in terms of the cues, basically. Okay, so that's what we just did. Okay, so list the flip-flop inputs. So I'm just going to add a column for each flip-flop input. D1. D2. <coughs> and so in the analysis, there was one part where you had to really think hard about what flip-flops do. That's where we are now. So fill in flip-flop inputs, flip-flop input values based on your knowledge of flip-flops. Along with present stage and next stage. Okay, so let's go through this part carefully. Let's just look at our first row. We have a D flip-flop. We're in this state, we're very happy. The current value of the flip-flops are zero, zero. The input is zero. After the next clock tick, we want Q1 to be a zero. What do we have to set the D input to in order to make the Q output a zero after a clock tick? This is a D flip-flop, we got to set it equal to a zero. Q zero, on the other hand, we want that to be a one after the clock tick. So what do we have to set D zero to? That's got to be a one. <coughs> and that's what you do. And again, for D flip-flops, these columns are going to be exactly the same as the Q columns. So we can just copy those over. But really what we're doing is we're saying, if we want this to be a 1 after the clock tick, we've got to set the D input to 1. But let's lose your minds for a minute. Let's suppose we decided to use T flip-flops instead of <coughs> D flip-flops. So far, nothing has changed, right? We're up to the point where we listed those T flip-flop inputs. But now when we fill in these columns, it's not just going to be a copy of what's in the Q columns. So let's look at the first case. Flip-flop one, currently it's outputting a zero, and after the next clock tick, we want it to still output a zero. What should we set the T input to? Zero, zero because zero says do not toggle. But flip-flop zero, currently it's outputting a zero. After the next clock tick, we want it to output a one. What should we set the T input to? One. one. That's a one. Okay, well, so far it looks like we're mimicking. 
Okay. And if we're in a zero and we want it to stay a zero, those are going to be zeros. And here's a zero and we want it to become a one, that's going to become a one. But let's look at this, this next case. Q0 is currently outputting a one. After the next clock tick, we want it to output a zero. So we should set the T input to a one. And that's not what the Q output is, right? So basically, if we want the value to change, we're going to write a one. If we want it to stay the same, we're going to write a zero. So I'll just fill these in just so we have them for later. And so this row right here, the sixth row, if D1 is currently outputting a one, we want it to output a zero, that's a toggle. It's currently outputting a zero, we want it to output a one, that's a toggle. Here's one, one, they're gonna stay the same, and here's one, one, we want the first one to stay the same, and the second one to toggle. So if we were using T flip-flops, we would still do the same steps when we got to the point where we're filling in the flip-flop input values based on the knowledge of the flip-flops, the present state, and the next state, right, we would end up with this. Okay, we'll go back and do JKs later, because JKs have an extra twist. But let's continue with our D flip-flops, okay, and we'll, we'll revisit this afterwards. But we're back, we're just doing D flip-flops, we figure out what the D input should be. Okay, now, write equations <coughs> for flip-flop inputs. In terms of flip-flop outputs, and whatever inputs you have going into the machine. So what have we got? We've got these things that we're trying to set up, and they depend on your present state and your input. Okay. This is a week one question now. We've done all the really hard stuff, all the new stuff, and now we just have a truth table. It's got three inputs and it's got two outputs, D1 and D0. We're trying to build a circuit that when you give it this input W and these inputs Q1, Q0, you get this output D1 and this output D0. Everybody knows how to do that, right? We can do a sum of products, we can do a product of sums, we could use a PAL or a <coughs> PLA, um, we can use K-maps to simplify it. There's all kinds of things we know about this part of the problem. So let me put this on a different sheet. And let's see if we can make some easy work of these equations. Well, let's not make it too easy. So let's, let's, um, let's just capture this. So I'm just going to transcribe 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, and D0 is 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0. So let's do D1. So it looks like it's going to be 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1. Write your 
equation, so D1 is equal to W um, Q0 bar or W Q1 or Q1 Q0 bar. Yeah, I messed up, man. <laughs> uh, da, 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 da. I don't see a quick fix for it, so we will do what you do on your homework. Put a big scribble there. I'll put an arrow pointing to the back, and we'll go from there. Thank you for catching that. should warn you up front, right? It's pretty typical that you don't get the right answer when you do these problems. Because <laughs> there's so many things where stuff like that can happen, right? Um, it's the process that's, that's most important. Yeah, tons of partial credit, which is why these take me like an hour to grade each one, right? Well, not an hour, but they can take me 15 minutes to grade one problem pretty easily. Hmm? More time on the quiz? That would be nice. Um, as much as it's practical, yeah. I mean, I, I do understand that these will take you longer and I won't give you 10 of these questions, right? Um, but the more questions you have, the more chance you have to demonstrate your understanding. Now this looks like it's going to be easier to build. Okay. So hopefully that's correct, and even if it's not, we're just going to pretend it's correct. Um, all right. So, and, and the equations aren't super critical for how we're going to finish this up, but just for completeness sake, let's do this for real. So here's W, Q1, Q0. So 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. That looks nicer. So D1 equals W bar Q1 or Q1 Q0 or W bar Q0. <coughs> term reuse possibility. So D2 equals Q1 Q0 bar or W bar Q1 or W <coughs> bar Q0 bar. All right, so we've got equations for the flip-flop inputs. Yeah. Is that a D2? <coughs> That's D2. <coughs> that D2 zero. Say what? Shouldn't it be D0? Mm -hmm. Not that it matters that much. You are right. Thank you. Absolutely. All right, so that's D0. Thank you. 
if you have like 15 people to help you with this, you got a better chance of getting it right. <laughs> yeah. All right. So we have equations for the flip-flop inputs. Okay. Let me go ahead and write those down over here. So D zero equals Q one Q zero bar W bar Q one <coughs> W bar Q zero bar D one equals W bar Q one Q one Q zero W bar Q zero. All right, so there's our equations. And this is where it's nice that our flip-flops already have complemented outputs. Because I don't need any inverters to implement this. I have direct access to Q1 and Q1 bar. I do need to invert W though. So I'm going to draw this as follows. So how do I generate D0? I take Q1, I take Q0 bar, and I end those. I take W bar, that's right here. I take Q1, that's right here. I end those. And I take W bar, Q0 bar. W bar, Q zero bar. And I'm going to OR all of those. And that's going to be the value I want for D zero. So I'm just going to take that. And then D1 looks like W bar Q1. Q1, Q0. And W bar Q0. for D1. Run that around D1. Voila, there's your mood machine. Find a poser. <laughs> yeah, you can pose if you want. <laughs> so that machine will do this, right? Every time you tick the clock based on the current value of W, it will move from one state to possibly a new state where the states are defined by the values of Q0 and Q1. Where are the outputs? Or so this diagram didn't have any outputs, right? But if it did, then we would have, in our transition table, we would have had a column for those outputs and they would be based on the present state and possibly on the input if it's a Mealy machine. And we would just have another thing to fill in in whatever it was we were doing that work. Back here, right? We would also have, say, Z1 and Z0. And we'd fill those in and we'd find equations for them. And then we'd have more circuitry over here that generates those outputs. They would just like <coughs> something similar to LED light, something like mm -hmm. that? Yeah. Yeah, and when, when we start with this, right, we're, we're kind of picturing a block diagram. There's a clock going in, there's some inputs going in, there's some inputs coming out, right? And we're building 
basically this thing. It's a box, you put in an input and a clock, and if there were outputs, there'd be some outputs coming here. Right, and all we're really doing is defining what's inside that box. And then if those go to LEDs or wherever, right, that's, someone else will decide that. So that's a full synthesis example, okay? And the only, Um, the only part that's really fundamentally new from what we did for the analysis is this figuring out what the D input should be, right? Otherwise, each of these individual steps is basically something we already did. We're just doing them all in a completely different order. But the actual question of what should these D inputs be, that's a fundamentally new Right? It's sort of the opposite problem. In analysis, we know what a D flip-flop does. We know what the D input is. Tell me what the new Q output is. In synthesis, we have a D flip-flop. We know what the current and next value should be for the outputs. Tell me what the D input should be. And so this is where we have this, this excitation table, this characteristic table business that's in the book. Right? So we can codify this into a table, but I would rather not. Okay, I would rather you think about, okay, this is a T flip-flop. If the input's one, it toggles the output. If it's zero, it stays the same. I've got a one and I want the output to be a zero. That means I want it to toggle. I'll set the T output to a T input to a one, right? So I'd like you to think about it like that because it will guarantee that you, you understand and are comfortable with these flip-flop behaviors. Oh, I had a question on finding the um, equation when you do the truth table. Yeah. Since they were like at, they're starting the same way to mess up and they're alternating, do you basically just kind of go through the transition table again, binary order? Well, what do you mean? Well, when it, it messed up, they alternate. I guess we go to the. So when I was. So yeah, we had our transition table like this. Yeah. So. And I was trying to just copy these columns over here. And kind of I totally them. copied them wrong because I had this one changing most rapidly. Okay, yeah. So it was just transcribe error from here to here. Because you just look for your inputs in previous states of zero, 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 and then you find zero, zero, one, and zero, one, zero. Yeah, so I mean, if I had done them in this order, then, then... Then you could have gone down, yeah. My second row would have been one, zero, zero, and then zero, zero, one, and so on. Okay. Right, but I did this without actually looking here. I just did this out of habit. Okay. So, don't do that. <laughs> All right, so there's, there's a bunch of steps in the beginning here, right? Choosing what kind of flip-flops, how many flip-flops, giving assignments between each state and the values of the Q outputs, listing all the rows in this table, Filling in next state based on present state and inputs from your diagram, right? That's all kind of mechanical. And then once you have these D inputs filled in, then it's a kind of a 120 problem, right? Here's a truth table, inputs, outputs, write some equations. Once you have equations, sketch a circuit, right? And between those two steps is this, this what I'm calling this kind of funky business of figuring out what the inputs of the flip-flop should be to get this behavior from present state to next state. Okay, so, um, so let's look at the case of T flip-flops. You've already filled in what the T input should be. Let's just, um, let's just do one of these equations and see what it might sketch out like. And I don't wanna go through the whole example because there's a lot of redundancy in there. But let's just think about T1. Um, So this is toggle flip-flop input T1. And there's only two cases where we have a one. One is where W is zero and Q1, Q0 are zero, one. So that's this box right here. 
And the other is when w is 1 and q1, q0 are 1, 0. And that's this box right here. So our cover is just going to be 1 by 1 rectangles. And t1 is going to be w bar q1 bar q0 or w q1 q0 bar. And so if we were building this whole thing with t flip-flops instead of d flip-flops, right, we would want to simply pick up the outputs of the flip-flops and wire up some circuit to generate the signal to E1, and we'd feed that back around to the T1 input on that flip-flop. And you do the same thing for T0, and you've got your circuit with T flip-flops. So let me talk about, so questions on that. And this is another one of these topics in here that, that will make more sense when you're actually doing it, right? I can explain it and there's a good chance that most of the steps from one step to the next kind of make sense to you. But the big picture of what's happening from beginning to end may be pretty blurry, okay? <coughs> doing this a bunch of times will clarify that. Okay, so we'll look at the homework at the end and, and that will be good practice for clarification. Um, let's think about JK flip-flops. So JK flip-flops have a pair of inputs. J and K. So let's just think about flip-flop one. So we're just looking at the present value, Q1, and the next value, Q1. So this first row, this JK flip-flop is currently outputting a zero. And what we would like it to do after the clock tick is output another zero. So let's Recall what a JK does. Okay, that's its truth table. So Q is currently equal to zero. And after the clock tick, the next value of Q, we want that to also be zero. So what should we set J and K to? Zero, zero, zero. Because that says the new value of Q is exactly the same as the old. Could you also set it to zero, one? Could also set it to zero, one, because that says make the new value equal to zero. So we got two options here. We can set j to 0 and k to 0, or we can set j to 0 and k to 1. In other words, as long as we set j to 0, we don't care what the value of k is. So we can fill in this row with a don't care. Um, if we're working with these, in theory, would it use less power if we had more zeros? Sometimes, sometimes more. It definitely affects it. But sometimes the ground state actually takes more power. But pretty, pretty small difference. OK, what's the best way to fill in this table? Zero, 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 one, or zero don't care? Don't care. Zero don't care, why? Because care. caring takes, takes effort. effort. Right? Better equations, yes. When we fill on our K map, we're going to have a dash here. Remember, that's an optional cover. Probably going to get simpler equations. This is why JK flip-flops are nice. They take more writing, more columns, but when it comes down to writing equations, chances are your equations will be simpler. And if you're building this thing, you want simple equations. Right? Fewer chips, fewer wires. All right, so. You want to do the same kind of analysis everywhere that you're filling this in. Let's do one more as a group. Um, 
Let's look at this third row. So Q is equal to zero and we want it to be a one. Okay, so we're filling in right here. Q equals zero. We want Q plus to be equal to one. So what should J and K be? So, yeah, ultimately you're right. Um, we could set it to a 1 and a 0 because that says make the new value equal to a 1. Or we could set it to 1, 1, which says toggle the current value, which will change the 0 to a 1. So as long as j is a 1, we don't care what k is. It's going to be like that for every single one. It's going to be like that for every single one. So we're going to get a lot of don't cares in here, which is really, really good. <laughs> yeah, j k is are awesome. All right, so then you fill that out, you do your k-maps, you write your equations, you sketch your circuit, you're done. I don't ever want to just circle only don't pairs in our k-maps, correct? you got to cover all the ones. But you don't want to But you don't have don't to pairs. cover the dashes. Gotcha. Right, so you don't cover a dash unless it's helping you make a smaller equation. Right, so if it's isolated, ignore it. Yeah. I know we don't like to talk about the excitation table, but I That's think okay. that... That's okay. Yes, so here's what we can do, and this is, this is the point where we talk about <coughs> excitation tables. Um, this is the behavior, the characteristic table of a JK flip-flop, okay? This is, um, if this is J and this is K, this is the new value of Q, okay? Um, well, let's, let's, let's just finish this up, and then we'll... So if Q is zero and we want the new value of Q to be one, we can either set JK to one zero because that's a set, or we can have, oh, that's what we just did. Um, <laughs> let's say we've got a one and we want the new value to be a zero. Okay, so we could do zero one because that forces the flip-flop to a zero, or again, we could do one one, which is a toggle. So that's a don't care one. Or if Q equals one, and we want the new value to be one, we could do zero, zero, don't change anything, or we could do one, zero, force the output to a one. So this is a don't care zero. Okay, so we can gather all of this into another table. And this is a big time saver when you're doing this, when you're working on filling in a table like this. But you've got to understand where this comes from. Okay? If you just jump to the table and you use it to fill this in, you're not going to understand what's going on with these flip-flops. So here's what we can do. Here's the current value of Q. Of Q. Here's the next value that we want. What should we set J and K to? So if we've got a zero and we want the new value to be zero, we should set JK to zero, don't care. If we've got a zero and we want a one, we should set JK to one, don't care. If we've got a one and we want a zero, set JK to don't care, one. And if you've got a one and you want a one, set it to don't, code, don't care and zero. So if you have this, and I recommend having this on your tests, right on your note sheet, then when you want to fill in this table, it's like, okay, we've got a one, we want to go to a one, um, we'll just fill in a don't care and a zero. Okay? But be absolutely sure that you actually understand that this is what's going on. Because there's too many times in the past where I see people trying to do this, and they're working with this table, and they've got this table next to their problem, and they're trying to figure out what the new value of Q is from this, right? And it's, it's totally a different table. It's really capturing this analysis just into a nice, succinct form. Yeah? So we would only use that table for this type of process? You can use this table any time that your goal is to change your flip-flop from one value to another, and you want to know how to set the inputs. And this is, this is the typical example. There could be others. You use this when you're, you've got the inputs, you want to know what the outputs do. 
you use this when you know what the outputs are doing and you want to know what the inputs are. Is there an input? So I think this is the <coughs> excitation table and this is the characteristic table. All right, let's take a real quick look at the homework because I want you to get going on the homework um, for next time, probably for next Thursday, but I want you to get going on it as soon as you can. So we're in Chapter 5, and we'll talk about why you want four flip-flops and stuff next time. So design a two-bit binary up counter using D flip-flops, then T flip-flops, then JK flip-flops. And there's all the solutions, so a good three or four pages. And then you do the same thing for a down counter. Um, design a BCD counter. So a BCD counter counts from 0 through 9 and then back to 0. And these are all just design problems. Design a counter that starts from 2, counts up to 7, and then goes back to 2. So 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Right? And for each of these, you start with a state diagram, and then you do everything that we've been doing. Uh, design a finite state machine that performs present state, next state, and accordance. So we've got two states in this machine and two inputs, X and Y, and you want your next state to be one of these based on your inputs and you want to generate an output. So the first three problems you should be good to do or to at least think about pretty seriously. This is another presentation of what we want our system to do. It's a timing diagram, so work with that. Um, question five, so there's, there's a different version of the mood machine. Um, I'll tell you what this mood machine is. Um, so you can do that. And then question six. Question six, don't spend too much time on because if you do it exactly as it says, it's a really, really, really long problem and I give you simplifications for it. So work on the first five problems, okay, from the homework. <laughs> For, um, for next week. Bring in questions on Tuesday. They'll probably be due on Thursday, okay? But start them as if they're due Tuesday. One through five, you said? One through five, yeah. And you can look at six and seven. Think about them. Okay. All right, cool. I will see you on Tuesday. Have a good long weekend.